As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. It's good to see you. This is the vlog number 59, and we are in, on the 4th of May, 2021. The lectionary passages are some classics, Acts 9, 1 to 6, and then it actually gives you an alternative of 7 to 20, which is the story of Paul's uh, Damascus Road conversion experience, his Damascene moment. Uh, this is one of the most incredible, uh, brilliant, spectacular, stellar stories in, in the history of literature, and I just wish we could spend the time to, to go through it point by point, scene by scene, um, and plot by plot. We don't have the time. So I've, I've restrained from, from uh, spending about two to three hours with you on this, on this one uh, lectionary passage. The psalm, uh, Psalm 30, has some of the most memorable and tender phrases, a part of it that we know of. I cried to you for help and you healed me. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy, what? Comes with the morning. You've turned my morning into dancing. Some of the beautiful phrases of the, of the, the promises of the, the Psalms. And then Revelation 5, 11 to 14, this great incredible scene where everyone is gathered around uh, the Lamb singing to the one seated on the throne. And uh, the, the song is, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. And the four living creatures, you remember? You find this in Ezekiel, you find this in Genesis. Each one of these creatures is a symbol for the Gospels. The lion, uh, the bull, the eagle, and the, the human. And those four, four creatures are also part of this entourage, representing uh, all of creation. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Now, that is a very different declaration than the one that you sometimes hear in some praise music. Um, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive my praise. You are worthy, God, to, to receive our praise. And, and hear our praise, O worthy one. Um, as if we were in a position to tell God that God's worthy enough to receive our praise. I mean, no, no, no. This is a declarative statement. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. It's not a statement that says, um, you know, in my estimation and in my judgment, which is clearly um, very, very high, you are worthy. You are worthy, God, to receive our praise. Um, so that's just a pet peeve of mine. I'll stop there and because uh, I could spend the whole time on that one, too. But I, I do want to uh, do some semiotics with you um, of, of John 21, 1 to 19. This is the third post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. And um, Peter announces to the disciples, I'm going fishing. And a bunch of them said, okay, we're going too. And there were a total of seven. Seven of them, of the 12, of the 11 uh, disciples, now 12 are out, out fishing. It's always, you know, it's been curious to me. Jesus chose four fishermen um, and um, to, to, to be on his team. And here you got three more. So you got seven out there fishing. Um, clearly, there's something about fishing and uh, that is this key. A Jesus' team is a fish team, um, at least a team that likes to go fishing. And maybe there's something about this metaphor of fish that, uh, that we're missing. And you know the story. They caught nothing. And um, Jesus is about 100 yards away on the beach. Um, he's uh, not being recognized by the disciples. This is the number one problem they always have. In every post-resurrection appearance of Jesus, they don't recognize him. They have trouble 
recognizing who he is and and Jesus um, is cooking some breakfast. Now, we, we have no idea. Um, in some way, every post-resurrection appearance involves food. Um, it's a, it's a, this is another food story. If you read the Gospels, I mean, Jesus is either on the way from food, on the way to food, in the midst of food, talking about food, uh, thinking about food, telling stories about food. <laughs> Again, Jesus is a foodie. And all these stories. Um, and, and Jesus here some, summons them with the phrase, come for breakfast. Come on. I've got breakfast prepared. Come for breakfast. He's got a charcoal fire. He's got fish and bread. And then uh, Peter jumps out of the boat. He, he, you know, fish because they're clothes, their tunics, and all that kind of stuff you can get in the net. So they often fish naked. And he, he puts his garment back on, jumps in the water, and... And they all um, um, come aboard to see Jesus. And Peter hauls the net onto the shore. Big fish. After Jesus tells him to, to throw the net to the other side. It says big fish. And he even gives us a number. 153 big fish. 153 big fish. Um, why? the specificity of 153. Why is that number mentioned? And there's been a lot of speculation on this. Um, throughout history, we've had a lot of, of uh, candidates. Uh, in the fourth century, Jerome thought that there was only 153 species of fish in the world, so it was an expression of the totality of the world. The part of the mission of the disciples as fishers of men was and women, it was to go to the whole world. Well, he was about maybe 30,000 off. I mean, there's not 153 species of fish. There's like 30,000 species of fish. And, and I'm sure that marine biologists will find more as time goes on. So um, th there's, there's not that uh, as, a good, as a good reason. Augustine... He loved to play with numbers. Numerology was really important. Numbers would signify something. Um, and so he'd go, and, okay, you got Ten Commandments, Old Testament, Seven Gifts of the Spirit, New Testament. Add Ten and Seven together, you got Seventeen. You got Law and Spirit. Well, so you got Seventeen. But if you add One plus Two plus Three plus Four all the way to Seventeen, you come out with 153. Okay. So... This is a, okay, 153 is an expression of holiness. That's the holiness of uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus is being, being affirmed here. Um, the key to understanding 153, and it's really not that hard if you just do your little semiotic homework, okay? The key to understanding 153 is, first of all, the discipline of historical context, which means you've got to put... John's Gospel in the context of its day, why it was written, where it was written. First of all, where did John write this Gospel? Ephesus, right? Why did he write this Gospel? To invite Greeks to become followers of Jesus. Um, so what's the importance of Ephesus and what's the importance of, well, Ephesus is one of the greatest ancient seaports of its day. But more than that, it was the most important Greek city in, in Jesus' day. The Temple of Artemis was there, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And when contemporaries of Jesus thought of the height of Greek culture, the, the, the very summits of, of Greek culture, they didn't think of Athens. They thought of Ephesus. Ephesus was the epitome, uh, the very apex of, of Greek culture. And partly, they, when they thought of what made Greek culture so special, they thought of, you know what, mathematics. They thought of Pythagoras. They thought of Euclid. They thought of Archimedes. These three great Greek mathematicians. Well, you say, well, what about Plato? Yeah, they thought of Plato. Plato was headquartered in Athens. That's where his academy was. But even Plato had an inscription carved over his archway. Let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. In other words, you had to get your math right before you could be a philosopher. So 
the, the, the whole uh, Greek culture expressed uh, and, and uh, exemplified in, um, in these three, in Ephesus, the city, but also in Pythag Pythagoras, Euclid, and Archimedes. And by the way, when you thought of any of them, individually or collectively, guess what you thought of? 153. 153, the magical mystery number that was associated first with Pythagoras, then with Euclid. In fact, the first whole chapter in his classic text is dedicated to 153. And then um, um, uh, Archimedes. So to tell a story with 153 as its punchline is to say to the people listening to this story, we know your culture, we honor your culture, and your culture is important to us and it is a part of our culture. Now you say, okay, what in the world are you talking about? Um, the number 153 is the numerical equivalent of an image. In fact, when you thought of 153, you thought of an image. You thought of a geometric shape. And that geometric shape was known as the vesica piscis. Okay? Piscis, of course, is, is fish, the bladder fish, uh, or the vulva fish. And the vesica piscis was also known as the mandorla the mandorla. Archimedes, in his measurement of a circle, about 250 BC, referred to this ratio, 153 to 265, as the measure of the fish. This is his definition of the square root of three. It is the measure of the fish. And it, 153 was a shorthand or abbreviation for pi. That, that little constant called pi. In Archimedes' solution for solving for pi, he uses 153 as the key denominator. But it goes back even before that, before Archimedes to Pythagoras. Um, and so 153 um, is the, um, um, the image form for the mandorla, or let me put it this way, the intersection I'm going to put this up here so you can see it. The intersection of two overlapping circles where the center of the circle uh, is equal on uh, both sides, the same radius, and they intersect in such a way that the center of each disc lies on the perimeter of the other. And this right here, right here, and this is 265 and 153, is called the Vesica Piscis, or the, the Mandorla. The, the famous fish story of uh, Pythagoras, and again, when you thought of Pythagoras, you thought of, of this fish story, everybody knew it. And supposedly, in his travels, he ran across some fishermen uh, pulling ashore a net, full to overflowing with some fish. It's a very similar story to this one. And uh, he told the fishermen that were straining to pull in this net, he knew exactly how many fish were in that net. And they said, oh, no, you don't. You see, yes, I do. And they said, well, let's, let's, let's have a little game here. Let's gamble a little bit. And, and if you can guess the exact number of fish we have here, because we don't even know, but if you can guess, then we will, you can ask us anything and we will do it. And he said, okay. And he said, you have 153. Now, he did not say in the original story a number. And this is where the mystery comes. He said, I will, I will tell you the number. And he told them the number. The original story doesn't say 153. And he said, I told them the number, and when they counted the fish, sure enough, it was that exact, exact number. And the problem is that when Pythag Pythagoras said, okay, now my one request of you is you let the fish go. Well, they didn't let it go because it was a lot of money. And uh, so they did not honor that agreement, um, and they refused to do it. But there's been a lot of, uh, you know, kind of play about what was that number. 
But Pythagoras himself later calculated that 153 is the denominator of the closest known fraction to the square root of, of 3. So the number 153 became associated with the story. Well, 153, of course, is the number that Pythagoras must have given as the mystery uh, number of great fish that they, they uh, hauled in. So let me, let me show you again, just so we, we get this, this clear here, um, that the symbol of 153, all right, is the result of these two, uh, the Vesica Piscus, the Mandorla, is the result of these two, um, the fish shape drawn between two overlapping circles, which are centered on each other's circumference. And the ratio by Pythagoras and then by Archimedes and by Euclid was called the measure of the fish. Um, the measure of the fish. And you can see how easy it was for this fish symbol, uh, which is built in, the ichthys symbol, which is built into this 153 image, uh, took off and became, before the cross, the earliest known marker for a follower of Jesus, um, a follower of, we, people, we are people of the fish who follow the, the fishermen and whose sign and symbol became, became the fish. Um, if these two circles represent, you ready? God and humanity, the fish is Jesus. Hence, we are the people of the fish who follow the measure of the fish who follow 153 and hence the symbol of 153 in the in the story now the uh and i i will try and put this out so you can uh you can uh, see this on the on the vlog a little a little better um but the mandorla this the shape in the middle uh, later became the, the Pythagorean and Euclidean and, and Archimedean uh, associated with the, the fish. But originally, this symbol has a, another, um, and this is where the mandorla comes from, it is the symbol of the almond. And one of the most incredible, uh, important symbols and signs in Hebrew history is the almond right here, the mandorla. It's so important and has been so important that if you want to show how holy a, a person has been, a saint, you put a halo over them. If you want to show how holy a scene is, you would frame that scene in this shape here, a mandorla. And if you look at a lot of Christian art, you'll see that it's not a square. It's not a circle. It's a Mandorla, the, mand the almond, what was Aaron's rod? An almond branch that had three things on it. it and it was very specific, buds, blossoms, and fruit. Um, hmm, what was the golden lampstand? <laughs> it was an almond tree. There's seven branches, and each one of those branches had to have three things on it. A bud, a blossom. And a fruit. When you think of a golden lampstand, you're not thinking of gold and just a lampstand. You should, you should be thinking of a golden almond tree whose symbol is right here, the mandorla. Uh, Jeremiah, I'm on. And, you know, Jeremiah, I want you. What do you want me to wear? I, you know, I, I want you. you no, know, but I got all these excuses. No, Jeremiah. In fact, then God touches Jeremiah's tongue with a, with a coal, a fire from heaven. And then ask Jeremiah, what do you see? And he goes, I see Aaron's rod. He, he didn't say that. He said, I see the branch of an almond tree. What is the symbol of Judaism? No, it's not a star of David. That's the symbol of the state of Israel. The symbol of Judaism is a menorah. A menorah is an abstract almond tree, an abstract golden lampstand, the almond. 
hugely significant. And this, whether you're talking about the 153, the measurement of the fish, whether you're talking about the mandorla, the, it is created when you bring two opposites together and you live out of this, not to, not to make them any less opposite, but to bring them into relationship in this sweet spot, right here in this sweet spot. And it's in that sweet spot, that's the fertile crescent of Christianity, right here. Um, here's one, bring arts and sciences together and you get wonder in the middle, exactly. You bring the divine and the human together. You bring heaven, you bring God and human together and you get Jesus in the middle. You bring the divine and the human together and that's what humans are. You can't be human without the divine, that's the mandorla. You can't be, you can't do earth without heaven. That's the mandorla. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah and he's the lamb of God. To take. See, if you're not hearing out of both ears, you're not hearing Jesus in stereo, you're not hearing Jesus because Jesus always comes in surround sound. I want you to be as wise as a serpent, but as, and as, I want you to find yourself, but you find yourself by losing yourself. You want to be first, I'll tell you how to be first. You be. See, and you live out of that sweet spot. This is not a Hegelian synthesis where you get rid of the extremity of either. No, I am saint and I'm sitter, but I'm fully saint and fully sitter. But at the same time, you live out of, I am saint and I am, I am sinner. Um, you, we could go on and on here. Um, but the 153... The mandorla image, the measurement of the fish, the sign of the fish, is a reminder to us all. And then see what the Christians did is they just took this symbol of this mandorla symbol of Judaism, and they opened it up. Okay? They opened it up and just continued the circle, but they opened it up and opened up to Gentiles and to the whole world. So this week, find in your life. Um, th th this is a culture that is becoming more global, is becoming more local. I mean, we bring the two together. We find, uh, we, but we start with the particular and then we go to the universal. We live out of that global and local, the global. We live out of that together. Um, so, the semiotics of 153, it's not hard if you just do your homework, just do your background. And it takes us in directions, as Jesus warned Peter, if, I, if you follow me, the sign of the fish, the measurement of the fish that is that I will take you in directions you do not wish to go. And I leave you with one little challenge. Sometime this week, think of one time in the past year, outside of COVID, that you went in a direction you did not wish to go. See, if we can't only find ourselves going in directions we want to go, then who's in charge of our life? Who's the author of our story? We are. But if you're a follower of the fish and the great fisherman, then we will sometimes, as Peter found and all the disciples found, every one of them, that they will be taken in directions that they do not wish to go but that God is calling them to, as we hear him say, come and have breakfast. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember, it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon.